Good afternoon, everybody. I, um, thank you for having me. My name is Mark Swanziger. I'm a patient here at the Royal Free. I've had uh, uh, PRT since 2011. I started off with Y90. I had three rounds, and then uh, I had my first dose of uh, lutetium-177 back in 2015, and I've had two more rounds in 2017. And as of last week, uh, uh, sorry, now part of my, part of my can't carcinoid syndrome or whatever you want to call it is I actually suffer from a little bit of anxiety and, and uh, when I put under stress. So if you just give me, a, if you notice me just go quiet, it's, um, I, I'm feeling something coming on and I gotta fight it off. Is everybody, anybody else can identify with that? Yeah. Okay, okay, so um, thank you. But as of last week, the, the scans show that even though it's been a year since I've had my last round of lutetium-177, the tumors are still shrinking. So, um, uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting an applause. I, I spoke here four years ago at the original one, and I, I, was, I was assigned to talk about insurance, but I'm an American, so we don't deal with travel insurance. So I got totally blindsided, and it, the talk totally bombed. So I'm hoping that this one, I'll be more prepared. I've spent the last 1,200 days of my life trying to get Lutetium-177 approved by the NHS. Uh, now, I, I, like I said before, I am a private patient, so um, uh, it's just been my cause. All right, uh, let me see what else, did I, did I forget anything? Nope. Oh, Luthera was the name of the drug when I made the slideshow. So apparently, in the last couple weeks, it's changed its names. You might see oxoteride or something like that. But um, it's all by AAA, is the name of the drug company, and it's um, who has been bought out by Novartis. So, um, what I want to talk about is I just want to talk about the NICE process, what happened, what looks like it's going to get approved, and then um, also what PRT has meant to me. So as, how many people in here have had PRT? All right. How many people have no idea what PRT is? Okay, PRT is actually your uh, octreotide or your lanreotide with a nuclear bomb on its back. You go into the hospital, they inject you, um, it takes about 20 minutes with Luthera, then they leave you alone, which is rare in a hospital, which is really nice. You're in a lead-lined room, and you are totally isolated for the next 24 hours. The next day, they do a scan in the morning to see if the drug went to where it's supposed to go, and then from there, you're released. You need to sleep separately from your significant other for um, a few days, but r relatively, it's a very, very easy treatment. In fact, the first, the first uh, few times, I. I thought it was radiation sickness that I was actually dealing with, and what I was actually dealing with is I'm also a diabetic, is um, the steroids that they give you to manage the, the nausea and the, the radiation sickness were pushing my blood sugar super high. The last four rounds of PRT I've actually done on ibuprofen, so it's very, very tolerable, okay? so. Um, Hopefully that explains things. But um, lutetium-177, what they use for the NICE appraisal, and NICE, and let me give you a second to talk about NICE. NICE is the NHS's, uh, they're, the, they're the people that give the guidance. So technically, if NICE doesn't say that a doctor can talk about a drug, they're not supposed to talk about a drug. Okay, so it's, it's that level. Now, we're very fortunate to be in the Royal Free. These guys are world leaders in PRRT. There's, um, I've, I study, I watch the Americans uh, very, very closely. They've all only recently been FDA approved, and there's only a few places in America where you can get PRRT. So this, this is a world leader as far as um, what's going on with net um, treatments. Uh, nice. National Institute of, Communi of Care and Excellence. There's two main offices, one's in London, one's in Manchester. Uh, the appraisal that we went for was in Manchester. Uh, they, 
what, what blew me away with NICE right off the bat was how much the medics, nobody talks bad about NICE. Nobody likes to talk bad about NICE. They're, they're, they're very, very respected. So it is the circle of trust in the NHS. They, have, they ensure that the drugs are safe, effective, and also that they're not gonna bankrupt the NHS. Okay, so there's a, there's, or they have a formula, and I'm gonna explain that in a second, but they're, um, they're, that's their responsibility, and they're very, very good about it, and they're very, and um, it's kinda like when Professor Kaplan asks for something, people move. When NICE asks for something, people move. Okay. Um, these are the kaplan Myers graphs that you'll normally see associated with treatments. I think we saw them with Professor Myers things. Um, on Lutetium 177, this is what the line looks like if you don't have it. This is what it looks like if you do have it. In, and what you can see in, uh, in the cancer community is they're blown away by them numbers. To me, they don't look, they all go down, so they don't look that great. But to the cancer community, they're very, very jealous. Loads of people would like to have this kind of success rate. So that's where we're at. Um, now what NICE is trying to figure out is how much does it cost to get that green line for everybody on the NHS? That's a little closer. Um, what you're seeing there is this, it's roughly 24 months is kind of the mean for progression-free survival. Overall survival, it pushes it out uh, past 20 months. Now, they could stack the deck. They could stack the deck against age. They could stack the deck against people with really advanced disease. And they haven't. I haven't seen any evidence of that. So th that makes it a little even more amazing when they get something when they get something approved. Okay, and you see where it goes flat at the end. Part part of the now I'm also a retired military U.S. military, and then I'm also a ten-year defense contractor. So I know bureaucracy when you see it, and when you see things like decisions being made because the data isn't complete yet because people haven't died yet then um, there's something wrong with that kind of logic. So uh, that, that's, that's been some of the stuff that we, have to, that we had to deal with in this whole NISE appraisal um, evaluation. Um, I didn't like that kaplan Myers, so I came up with my own, this is, this is my own graph. So it took me about three months to figure out um, how to get Excel to do this. So I'm very proud of this graph. I would have, I got it done, but now I can't figure out how to update the damn thing. So, um, so you might see that there's, there's no, it hasn't been updated. I'll, I'll figure that out later on. But um, so basically I started off like most people, 2007, I had my major surgery, 75% of my liver was taken out. It's very, very tricky. Um, there was septicemia, there was uh, hernias, there was a lot of stuff to deal with. It was tough. Um, but that held me until about May of 2011. May of 2011 is when they said the cancer's back and now it's not operable. I said, well, you don't know this surgeon. This surgeon's really good. So I, I went back to the surgeon and I said, hey man, they said that you can't operate on it. He said, yeah, I, I can operate on it. So um, that was quite a blow. So at that point, I was referred, referred to the Royal Free, and just like maybe a lot of you guys, it takes a while to get into the system of the Royal Free because the growth of this community has been way, has exceeded everybody's expectations, right? So, um, but anyway, I got in and I got the first Y90, and then that's kind of my little spikes in quality of life. And this is my quality of life scale, actually. Zero is no life and one would be cured, okay? So I had to guess kind of what I, what I, where I was at. Um, and this is the part where patients can really own this. This quality of life number is really important. Um, so after 2011, it helped me. 
until basically 2014. Uh, let's see here. Well, I ran my first London 10K in May of 13. And then um, in 2014, oh, let me back up one second. When we started the PRT sections, they said you could have six rounds of PRT, and after that, you're pretty much, that's it. We gotta come up with something else. And when chemo is not offered to you, because, um, because it's not gonna, it doesn't have a very good success rate against really slow growing cancers. Um, after that sixth round, it starts getting a little bit dicey, right? So um, on the sixth round, I, I had that at uh, the Wellington. And Dr. Chanus came in and he said he just gave his, a, a guy his 12th round. And I said, well, oh, so, so then I started doing the math. And um, so I started figuring, well, if them three rounds hold me for, to here, I have it again, that'll hold me to here. Now we're talking about 23, 2024 before I need a treatment that's not invented yet. Right, so um, your mind definitely shifts, and and that that's what happened to me. So at that point in 2012, I, I went on medical retirement. I'm re, I'm on a, I've got a pension for uh, U.S. military, and then our our social security system actually pays your um, equivalent of a state pension if you have inoperable cancer in your liver. So I I got that. It's not it, it's not covering the bills, but. Um, it's, it's, it's provided quite a quality of life. So, um, yeah, that's it. Now let me update my slide here. What about what you did in April 16? Pardon? What did you do in April 16? Oh. In 2015, it also, she asked me what happened in April 6, 2016. She knows because she's my wife. <laughs> um, uh, in, also, in, 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 around this time I was taking my sex treatment, the CDF cut funding for PRT for the NHS patients. It was a huge blow to our community. Not just, not just the NHS patients, but everybody. It stopped. It's our momentum that we had going with all these new treatments and stuff. Just, it just took a huge punch in the stomach. It was, it was horrible. So at that point, I made uh, like, um, that's when I set my goal that it, someday they're gonna have an appraisal and I wanna be the patient rep to show them how good this stuff is. It's amazing. So I needed to raise my, my, my profile in the patient community. So on the bus, on the train ride from that last treatment, uh, the Net Patient Foundation tweeted out that they had their first ever London Marathon position. Okay, I'll do that. So I applied for it, and I got uh, nominated for that in December. And then, uh, so on, in April 2016, I ran a London Marathon. So, what else is going to demonstrate a quality of life, right? It took me three hours, 150 minutes. <laughs> I didn't break any... Um, I didn't, I didn't break any speed records, but um, so that's five and a half hours. That's a really long time. They're about ready to close the gate, but, but we did it. So, so from there, uh, a few months later, they came up and they said, all right, we're, we've, we've got our first appraisal in front of NICE, and we'd like you to be the patient rep for PRT. Great. I got... Um, I'm an NHS patient. I'm not an NHS patient. Is that a problem? No. And it actually, it's turned out to be quite an advantage because um, oh, you know, I didn't like that Myers Kaplan, that Kaplan Myers thing. This is my graph. Okay. As a patient, you get certain liberties. You get to you you can come up with stuff. It's, if it's in your brain, you you can think it. So. I call this the IQOL. There's a lot of people that are kind of angry with them, that uh, Steve Jobs from Apple that didn't, uh, he didn't, he hasn't seemed to do anything for the Neck Patient Foundation. But I think he has actually, because his, his iPhone chart matches my PRT chart almost perfectly. So back in 2007, I had my surgery. 
That held the tumors until about here. So then if I wouldn't have got PRT, it would have been like an iPhone 3. It would have been useless after a couple years. But I didn't, I had Y90. So from there, it carried me over to the next section. If I wouldn't have got the second round, it would have been like the iPhone 4, and it probably would have died. And, um, but I didn't, I got PRT, and it's gonna hold me till here. And then I get, um, I had, it's actually a little bit earlier. Like I said, I can't remember how to update my Excel spreadsheet. So this, this is my data I came up with in 2016. It was pretty close though. So um, now this is where I need round eight. The iPhone 8 was out last year. It, I mean, it, it, do you see where I'm going with that? So I'm just jumping from one line to the next, like jumping from iPhone to iPhone to iPhone. So, and if you don't get the treatment, then it's not good. But you know, conceivably, if I'm doing the math right, I could get out here to anywhere in between 2025 and maybe 2027 before I need a, there's, before I need a treatment that's not invented yet. <laughs> so it's all about we're not cured, but the definition of a cure, the best one I like, is when you die of something else, <laughs> right? So I've got better chances of dying of something else way down the road if you get there. So um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So once again, I really don't like that Kaplan-Meier graph. So I, I ran a difference equation, a difference formula against it. And this is what PRT means to me for life. This purple is from 2012, conceivably out here to 2029 on PRT. And if I wouldn't have had it, I think reckon somewhere around here, 2014, I would have ran out of options. So I'm, I owe everything to PRT. So that's uh, why I'm up here doing this. Now, we, when it, we went into the NICE appraisal, and um, I actually, I took this very serious. I, in, I read the instructions. They have a, about a 14-page tips and hints book. And on page 10, they came up, they showed this formula. It's called an ICER. And basically it says, if you can show that you can get an additional quality of life here, which was from my graph before, under 20,000 pounds, it's automatically approved. Well, that's gotta be the case. So I, what I did is I, I, a private patient, I've got all the numbers, I know what everything costs. The NHS does not know what everything costs. So um, it, it's, been, it, it's been an advantage to actually have me uh, do this as a private patient. So the formula is incremental cost effectiveness ratio. It takes additional quality of life years, which is time times your quality of life index. Okay. I just happened to guess that mine was a 0 0.73. That was a totally uneducated guess. I just thought it was pretty good. So um, I had to, you have, it's one of the things where you do the math and you figure if I'm, uh, let's, let's fix these numbers and bring them up. So, I, but it's very close and um, they have, they got some, they, they tell you exactly what they're looking for. So really, if you don't come in, um, let me tell you what their thing is. If you come in, if you, you can, if you've got a treatment that's safe and, and you can get an additional quality of life here under 10,000 pounds, you don't even have to meet the appraisal prices, the appraisal process. It is automatically approved. If it's under 20, it's almost automatic, but they still do an appraisal. They just make sure that um, it's safe, the licenses are on place, and they write the guidance for the doctors. So when you go into their office, they bring it up on the computer and it says, okay, he's got this, this is what you're allowed to talk to him about. If it's between 20 and 30,000 pounds, it's approved if it's a revolutionary treatment, which PRT is, no doubt about it. If it's over 30,000 pounds, it's rarely approved. Rarely, 115,000 signatures on a, on a breast cancer Herceptin petition, no, they got a no. 
It was too expensive. So if they can say no to 150,000, 115,000 moms and sisters, and then the emotion is taken out of it. We have to come in around 30,000 pounds, okay? How am I doing on time? I don't care. 1,200, 1,200, 1,200 days. This might go a little bit long, but uh, it, I, I, it, won't, it won't be that bad. So, um, uh, so, you know, I told you, before, kind of hinted before, the NHS really doesn't know what everything costs, and um, I, I barely know what everything costs, but uh, let me, this is how close I guessed it was. Uh, the, um, sorry, I'm having one of them moments. <laughs> I'll get it. These, these guys are, they're, they're, senior, they're senior government officials, they need the right data. Um, the drug company was coming in saying, this, this, the ICER, we, we compute it to be 27,000, which is under 30,000, should get approved. But the, the assessment group that NICE contracted out to do the evaluation to, to look at their numbers came back with 52,000. That's huge difference, right? So the best NICE can do is split it in half. So they split it in half, 39,500. It's too high. It's, that's a no. So, but that's when you figure 0.7. So I started asking, what's a, what is 0.7? And nobody knew, knows what a 0.7 is. 0 0.7 mean you can, uh, I don't know, work for seven hours a day. It, there's, there's no conversion for that number. So almost every drug is getting a 0.7. Well, PRT is so easy, it has to be better. So if you can get that up another point to 0 0.90, that drops that ICER by nine grand. Now we're in the ballpark, 30,700. So that's kind of what we had to figure out what was included with PRT. There's a lot of imagery that goes along with it. There's a lot of bug work that goes along with it. I mean, it's expensive. You've got you've to have a nuclear generator to actually make the drug radioactive in the first place. It means you've got to have a nuclear pharmacy, which means you've got to have a couple physicists laying around. They're not cheap. This is an expensive, this is an expensive drug. Meanwhile, the drug companies and this is, I gotta, I gotta give the drug companies a little shout out here. This is, I find this very cool. They're running at 100% production for private patients. What, and they can charge what they want there. Why do they wanna give some kind of discount to, um, to the NHS? It sounds heartless, but, but really, big business would think that way, right? So um, I did not find that from the drug companies. So I wanna, I wanna let them know that I'm very impressed so the first person that we usually like to, to kick is drug companies for being greedy. And in this case, I gotta say they're not, not necessarily so. Um, this is some of the data I showed that, uh, um, you know, on, a, on an ICER, uh, this is kind of close to what my ICER was as a private patient, 76 grand. That's a long way from 30,000. So we gotta do some real wrangling to get it from a private patient cost, 76 grand, down to 30,000, or we're gonna bankrupt the NHS. So I put a proposal together that they actually use the NHS to actually use it as a resource. There's a lot of people in America that can come over here, and there's a lot of wiggle room there that you could, you could start selling this to Americans, Chinese, people from all over the world and actually start, take maybe for the net, net cancer could actually be a pretty good model for helping save the NHS because it could pay for itself. You could export this stuff by bringing them here, right? Isn't that kind of cool? So um, I at least threw it out there. They know it, they didn't want it. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't within the scope, but it's been, it's been brought up. These are the key dates, 2016, invited by the, for the nice appraisal. Um, in 2017 was our first appraisal in, in Manchester. 
That was the first time neck cancer had ever met the NICE board officially. It was a two foot putt and we missed it. We were not, we did not have our stuff together. We didn't know the game. Um, you basically walk into a building, there's, it's like the men in black movies. You walk up this long staircase and there's, there's glass lined rooms, appraisal after appraisal after appraisal. You go into this room, there's a professor that's in charge of a big horseshoe. You got drug companies, you got the CDF, the guys that can canceled our treatment in 2015. You got the patient experts. You got me. You got um, Catherine Bouvier from Net Patient Foundation. You've got uh, Professor Vale from Manchester Hospitals, and you got Martin Etock from Northern Ireland, who also was a, a Net uh, specialist doctor. And then you've got the assessment group. Now, the assessment group. These are the guys that are contracted by Nice to check the numbers that the drug company are telling them. They're evaluating the clinical trials, which in our case was Netter 1, which is quite old data already. And, um, and then on the other side of the room, you have patient expert handlers, people that actually handle me. You've got health economists. You've got uh, everything. You, there was doctor, doctor, doctor. There was 20 doctors there in at the professor level. But there was no net specialist on this team. That, so that's one of the things. Um, and the scope of the appraisal included Eberolimus, Sunitib, and Lanreotide. Has anybody had any of them? I mean, Lanreotide. But Sunitib is uh, mostly for P-nets. Eberolimus is for faster growing uh, GEP nets. And this assessment group had no net specialist on it either. They, they wrote their documentation to actually com compare Eberolimus with, against Sunitib, against PRT, they're for different patients. It was just mind-blowing, the confusion. And sure enough, when the guidance came out, we, we, we lost. Now, thankfully, when you lose, you're supposed to go at the bottom of the queue and wait three years before you're readdressed. Nice, at least had the, they, they, they knew that should not happen. So, they, Eberolimus and Sunitib got approved at that time, and then PRT got pushed on into its own appraisal. And uh, um, the, the second appraisal came up in 2018. Meanwhile, in 2017, Novartis bought AAA for $3.8 billion. And it's, it's like they haven't got a lot of drugs. So this is, this is a big deal for them, because this labeled radiation-targeted therapy is new and it's it's a big deal so us getting it approved is actually going to be, be very beneficial right away for uh, a flavor for prostate cancer and then probably uh, metastatic breast cancer as well so the neck cancer we're looking after our own but you know we're, we're doing a pretty good job of establishing um, pathways for other types of cancer so um, the second appraisal came in in February 2018, and it was still messed up because we really didn't have a handle on what, was, what the ICER actually was. And them numbers, 27,000 from the drug company, AAA, and 52,000 from the assessment group, they're still there. So um, it, 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 I had no idea. I had no idea. I knew it was going to be close if, if they were going to prove it or not. So after the appraisal, when we all get to say our bid, the heads of the, of the NICE team go into a negotiation with the drug companies and they really try to cut a deal. And, the drug, and um, that, at that point, it becomes a private access scheme because now there's a, there's a deal between the NHS and the drug company. At that point, I lose vis visibility into what's going on. So, I, that's, that's on my list of things to try to get fixed. Uh, I think I've talked about the NICE committee of makeup. I'm going to 52,000. So, yeah. These are the victories. Lanreotide, Everolimus, and Sunitib have been approved. And LU-177, whether it's Luthera or Oxyotide, is looking very good. 
not for every patient group, but for probably three of the main ones. So, uh, and it's the final announcement is, I got an email yesterday from NICE saying I wasn't supposed to announce it until after the 29th when final guidance comes out. But um, it's looking very good for grades one and grades two. And last week I had my review with Professor Kaplan and he's got a very solid plan about getting it instituted for the NHS. So I, things, things are looking very good on a PRT front. Um, preparing for future NICE appraisals, we need to own the quality of life data. So when you see a questionnaire coming out, please take it. They need that data. And you might not think it's relevant. Like when you saw Professor Kaplan talking at the European NETS um, conference in Spain last year, you think, you're talking about quality of life data or a thing like that. Why does that matter? I want to know about treatments. The reason he's doing it is because quality of life data, he realized that if you brush that quality of life data up, the ICER drops by thousands. So that NICE can't use that data unless it's been briefed at a major conference or it's been published. So he's over there and he's, that's why he's doing it. He's briefing quality of life data to the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society because he's at a major conference and he's trying to drop that ICER by thousands. He's a clever chap. So, all right, he might tell you different, I'm not sure. That's, that's what I believe is happening and I have a very vivid imagination. So, um, now, what we're, we're really hoping is that the momentum comes back that we had in 2015. And still outstanding issues is the, the imagery side, the Gallium 68 and the PET imagery. And a new one that I hadn't heard about until last week is called PEN 221. This attaches the chemotherapy drug to the same hormone that we get every month, lanreotide or sandostatin or octreotide. Um, and this is talking about a cure now, because this, this chemo drug goes into the cell and kills it. So PRT just stuns it. So this is, this is huge coming. I don't, anybody in here on clinical trials? Are you allowed to say? Uh, but there are clinical trials right now for PEN 221 are on. And then now, and also pathways, so that patients can get into these big hospitals like the Royal Free and the multidisciplinary teams. There's a lot of work there. And there might be some work on the backside so that when patients like me that get put into maintenance mode go back to the communities, um, our original oncologists, and actually take some of our information back to them and free up some space. I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but I think Professor Kaplan's got a, got a plan. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Royal Free Team. They're heroes. Uh, um, one of them guys up there is now was on the panel of experts at the second NICE appraisal. So that's a victory for us. We have a net cancer specialist on the NICE committee. That was one of our issues to try to get done. That's a success. Uh, there's me. <laughs> it's running. I slowed down for my picture. That's my sister on the right. Um, she's also doing a lot of um, fantastic work and she has a, uh, a special interest as well. So in the neck cancer. And then also, uh, you asked about immunotherapy earlier. In, oh man, I forgot what it was. But if you, this is the first time at 15 minutes 09 in that video, if you can find it, uh, breakthrough of the year. That, that's Ron Hollander on the right. He's the first, he was the last CEO of the Net Research Foundation out of Boston. And it's Dr. Fisher on the left. And I can't remember her name, it's bad. But it's the first time I've heard the C word in any of these videos, instead of cancer, it's cure. So that's, that's a big moment. So, you know, eight years from now when I run out of options on PRT, I'm hoping that this thing happens. So. You, a, a lot of 
positive minds, do your exercise, eat your diet, stay involved with your doctors, take responsibility, for, use your power. You know, it's, it's huge. They got 12 whole likes, I just noticed that. <laughs> They're all me, I think. Okay, on November 10th is Net Cancer Day. I wasn't sure if we were gonna get approved, so I was getting ready to um, pull out the stops on the quality of life wheelie. Um, but we're gonna have a black and white ball in Oxford. So you're all invited. If you'd like to come, tickets are 50 pounds. They include a drinks reception, live music, and a three course dinner. And the band is my band, the Acoustic Supper Club. And that's me up on top. So, uh, so we're gonna have a good time. So if you wanna go out in the afternoon and, and, and spread, word, spread the word of Nets cancer in hospitals and then drive up truck up to Oxford and party with us, it'd be great. So you, you can get, um, I have some of these flyers over here. I'll, I'll hand them out afterwards if you're interested. Or just send me an email. And, uh, do you mind passing them to me, please? And so, yeah, that's it. But um, uh, yeah, that's enough. So, are there any questions? Oh, okay. How significant do you think that um, the Novartis purchase of Three A's was? Because Three A's was a very small company, and Novartis are a much larger company, therefore they're much able to. Price. That's an excellent question. The question was, how much of an impact did it have Novartis have on purchasing AAA, which is a small French company? They were huge. Okay, they um, first of all, on a couple different levels, PRT was being compared against Everolimus on the uh, second appraisal. Okay, now Everolimus had a private access scheme in place. I don't know if I should be talking, if this is, but I don't care. The Everolimus had a private access scheme in place, so it really means that AAA wouldn't know what, what, how far they have to bring their price down to compete with the deal that Everolimus had. It was kind of like shooting in the dark. Well, Novartis owned Everolimus. So when Novartis bought Everolimus, they owned both. So. Yeah, they should be able to reach in and see what the deal was. So I don't know if that's what happened. That's in my mind, that's what happened. So it was huge. And then also, they coached that young drug company rep from AAA that met the first drug appraisal. They drilled him like a dog in, in about being ready for every question. They had a health economist assigned to him. He was a lot more prepared about what was going on when he went in. And that was, um, that's something that I hope on the patient expert side, I can be involved with in the future, nice appraisals, is I can be involved with coaching whoever's going up to represent that drug or that therapy. So, good question. So, yes sir. If we take the economics out of it, which is predominantly the role of NICE, how big a hurdle was it to get PRIT through the FDA, which is not quite so preoccupied with economics, but, you know, because you know what a health system yep. like in the US. Um, the question was how big of a hurdle in America was it to get approved in the FDA? I'm not really sure. I think as Novartis had a lot to do with it. I know that I'd like to think that I had something to do with it. Because the, the patient rep that met the board, that was my equivalent on the nice praise, I groomed her. So um, she's from Nashville. Her name's St Stacy Chevier. She writes a really nice blog. If you want to find out some inter interesting stuff about PRT, um, I, my oldest daughter just happens to, or my youngest daughter now, lives in, um, lives in Nashville. So I, I met her, and she's an amazing woman. And um, so that they, it was, it was, it did not look good going into FDA because the CDF, the NHS cut the treatment right before it went into the FDA. That was not good timing for PRT in the states in America. Somehow they got it approved. I'm not, I'd like to know more about it. 
next time in Nashville, I have a couple drinks with her. <laughs> so um, that's a really good question. Any more questions? I'd like to ask about the applicability, the, um, what is it, 177? The availability? The, no, no, the, the fact that it may not be totally appropriate for everybody because of the, you've got to have the receptors on the tumours to take it and sometimes the NETS doesn't exhibit the tumours in quite the way, you know, it, it changes. Yep. Um, I just wonder whether you could say anything about oh, that. You may not it, be able to. It, it's, it's a good question. I don't know if you, one of our challenges yet is for gallium 68, the gallium 68 scan. The gallium 68 scan shows you a level of detail way above the, what an MRI machine can show you, and it shows you where the cancer is spread to. And the first report you see from that gallium is scan scared the hell out of me. So it, and it is in my jaw, it's in my neck, it's in my shoulder, it's all over. You know, but. What it does tell you is it tells you if, if you're a good candidate for PRRT. That's what it's all about. And it, um, so I'm not really sure how they're going to do that if gallium is not approved. So that, that's a tricky one. So it's a, it's, it's a, um, did I answer your question? I, I, I know I had two scans. One was um, a PR and the other one was gallium. And they gave different results initially. showed up very well, so I became a candidate for this treatment. Oh. But initially, I wasn't a candidate for this treatment. Because, because the gallium was... Because there was the receptors. Did, did, you, did you guys hear that? It was saying, the first set of tests, it wasn't showing that it was going to be... A, that the uptake was going to be there for PRT to be successful. So there's no sense in spending that, you know, that, that money, effort, all that thing about if, if the tumors aren't going to be susceptible. But his second gallium, 68, is um, showed that it was showed there there was potential for uptake. So, um, what I was trying to get at was it isn't always appropriate. For every no, it's not. It's not appropriate. And then that's the other. That's the nice thing about Everolimus is that if you're not a candidate for PRT, then you got to start looking at chemo or Everolimus. So, there are options on the backside if you're not if you're SSRTs. I'm, uh, I can never remember that acronym, but. Um, if, if they're not there, then, uh, he, yeah, so you still have some options. So, and the best option is to, is, you know, being right here. This, this, these guys are amazing. So, any more questions? Anybody interested in coming to Net Cancer Ball on 10 November? <laughs> Just got a few more. Uh, over half the tickets are sold. It's going to be there's a, oh, about 130 people coming so far, so it's going to be a good crowd. It's not going to be just me and you, which would be good anyway. But um, um, you know the cancer, the the guitar thing. <laughs> I taught myself how, guitar when I was heavy into carcinoid syndrome, sitting on the toilet for three hours a day. So that's coming a long way from that to that, and um, so. I just want to thank the Royal Free and everybody for having me, so. Yes, sir. Can you give us any idea about the categories that are used to determine the quality of life measurement? Okay. The, the, pack, the question was, what packages do they use for the quality of life index? What NICE wants is they want an EQ-5D-5L. I have been looking it up. Netto one uses in the European Quality of Life study, but uh, it, it's patented. You have to apply, go through a pretty lengthy process to get access to this questionnaire. But the questionnaire is basically, can you get out of bed without help? Can you put your clothes on without help? Um, can you feed yourself without help? These basic, basic questions. And they're, the 5L at the end means I need a little bit of help. I need significant help. They're, they're at different levels. But at the end of these five questions, they ask you, in between 0 and 100, 100 being perfect life, what do you think you are today? So I'm encouraging you, if you get asked that question, and 
Think about the impact that it has on that icer where it drops it. I would say 99. <laughs> so in, in that two-tenths of a point makes a huge difference. So when you think, when people tell you, yeah, positive mindset makes a big difference in your treatment. Yeah, it does. If you think 0.9 versus 0.7, you, you, you get treatments. So yeah, hopefully that makes it, that's an excellent question. But as patients, we need to own that data. That's our power, that quality of life index. So I'm, my next challenge is to get with the Net Patient Foundation and Professor Kaplan and whoever wants to work with me on it, but we need to figure out how to measure that so that it, it's live. And um, these, I, I think that quality of life index, if we took it back to where I actually was, um, had carcinoid syndrome, it might show, it might, um, uh, it might trigger some tests that would say, hey, this, 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 this guy's sick. Let's start looking at stuff, you know. Um, an example of that, my sister works for a big data company. During the Ebola crisis, they got twi she got Twitter and the United Nations to share data. So they went and looked at the traffic, um, Twitter traffic in Africa, which I found quite odd. But um, uh, there was a spike in Twitter traffic a couple weeks before an outbreak. So they started monitoring that data, and they could tell where they needed to put their hospitals. So maybe, you know, this quality of life things, if we think outside the box, this could be huge. You know, wouldn't it be great? There's things going with voice, with voice, um, uh, voice uh, analyzation where they can tell, you know, if you're under stress. So, and you might not even feel like you're under stress, but your voice gives you away, okay? Well, one of the most prevalent guys that has neck cancer, his name is Dag Kitlis. Do you, does anybody know who he's, what he's responsible for? He's responsible for Siri. Okay, so, um, you know, maybe we start thinking outside the box, there's some, there's some things that could, that could um, you know, we could do things even cheaper and bring down that ICER. So, any other questions? Pardon? Apparently, Gloria Estefan. Oh, oh, Aretha. Oh, yes, and then yeah, and then and, and that's what we all want, is right? R E S P C, R E S P E S. Yeah, but I can't even spell it today. But I think we'll be doing an Aretha song. <laughs> um, but yes, unfortunately, rest in peace. So she she did have it. So, and that that's um that's tricky. She had peanuts apparently. And, um, and the, if you looked at the Twitter traffic for net patients or net cancer, there's a spike there, um, mostly. But people correcting all the all the um, tweets on her having just plain old pancreatic cancer. But you know, there's it's important for us to reach out to these other types of cancers. I reached out to the breast cancer now people when I, was, when I was figuring this out. You can do things as a patient that you can't do if you're an employee of the NHS. So right, so if you think about it. Professor Kaplan is an employee of the NHS. There's some things that you don't do to your boss. You don't make them look bad. I mean, you, he, there's gotta be some rules, right? But you, as a patient, we have, we have power to reach out to these people. All they can say is no. So I reached out to the breast cancer now people. Um, I reached out to Cancer Research UK. I chased down a couple health economists. I called the drug guy. We had a really nice conversation. So, but I needed to know what, what his strategy was going into that thing, into the appraisal. As a team, we needed to be united going in there. So I didn't reach out to the assessment group people. That, that, that's, that, that, um, that's a nut I didn't get quite get cracked. But um, as patients, there's advocates and there needs to be some diplomacy. So into that point, I need to put the diploma hat, diplo diplomat hat on and go out and talk to some of these people and find out some lessons learned. And Catherine Bouvier and the Net Patient Foundation, and they've been, they've been great. So um, is there, well, I can go on for hours. You got, <laughs> um, any other questions? No? 
All right. Uh, oh, one. Excellent speech. I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I don't think you've covered this quality of life bit properly. Okay. It's a, you know you've made the point that it is a really big thing, but how can we as a you know as a group of you know, disparate people who've never spoken to each other before? How can we help the the groups you know in the NHS yourself? How can we help them to you know, raise this quality of life issue. I don't know that. Oh, okay. The question was, how can you help me get a handle on this quality of life, or how can we help each other get a handle on this quality of life? I don't really know. <laughs> They're talking about setting up some apps. The Net Patient Foundation is, is, is uh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Well, at, at the Royal Free here, they're talking about developing an app. At the Net Patient Foundation is talking about uh, developing an app. The Carcinoid Cancer Foundation has an app. And basically, if you're tracking, if you were tracking your quality of life every day, especially after taking treatment, then that data should go all into a, a big repository. And we need to all be, if we're all talking what NYS expects to hear, which is the EQ5D5L system, then whenever NYS, we don't have to back up and go back into double blind, maybe we don't have to go back into double blind placebo trials and that kind of information. So we should, out of netter one, Maybe the biggest thing we found out is actually what the people that got placebos got. Okay, so, and then we know what the effect is of doing nothing. So, and I mean, that's, I mean, that's another example of, of mind, mind, of using your mind, positive mindset. Um, if they don't believe that, you know, your mindset makes a difference, then why are we talking about placebos? So at the very end, I don't want to be told that you, there's no options for you, Mr. Swanziger, but you can always hand me a handful of placebos and I'll be very, very grateful. So, oh, you have another question? Yeah. Um, at the 20th anniversary uh, presentation um, that was uh, uh, directed by uh, Professor Martin Kaplan, um, this was in February this year, there was a professor called John Ramage who's b is based out of Basingstoke uh, and King's College in London. Um, and he actually has attempted to actually classify some of the areas of looking at um, quality of life. Basically, he starts from where are you now versus where are you would like to be and looks at things like psychology, emotional needs, um, what sort of symptoms you're actually uh, um, having um, on, a, on a daily basis what sort of care you're getting, how you feel about that, and um, looks at a, a lot of things which add up to what people um, define as qualities that actually help, if, if you like, on a scalar model to do so. So there is some basis under which people are being encouraged to look at where they are on the scale from this particular parameter of where are you today and where would you like to be? So those are the sort of ideals. That's an excellent point. There's a lot of, and, there, and that stuff needs to be figured in. I mean, were, were there the, the minimum that NICE is looking for is for the 5D, five dimensions. If you go on eHarmony and you're looking for a spouse, they're gonna look for 29. You know, we could, um, I read that in a book. It's not because I went there. But um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different levels of doing this. And on the Net Patient Foundation or website, there's a questionnaire. I encourage everybody to go there and take it. The more data they have, the more they can do for us. And they actually have, Catherine Bouvier has hired about a year ago, they hired a, a data analyst to go into the NHS database and actually start looking for, you know, what is the true numbers of how many neuroendocrine patients are out there and how many cancers that we've had. So we're still learning. So, um, and 
we expect it to be bigger numbers. So the, that's, uh, we still got a lot of work to do. I was expecting after this appraisal was over, I'd be done. And, but really, we're just getting going. So, uh, you know, we're, we got some successes and we beat our head up against the wall to get this done. But, um, so, uh, any other questions? <laughs> no? Oh, one more? Okay. Yeah, um, in a way, uh, you're the difference between Professor Meyer being a minor chord and you're a major chord in terms of the quality of how you make us feel. And sometimes it's easy to listen to the clinicians giving you, well, maybe four years, maybe five years. But it doesn't matter how long you've got if you've got that quality of life to be happy. And it's people like you motivating us to give us that. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, I barely know the difference between a minor chord and a major chord, but yeah. The minor chord has a flattened third in it. So if you want to know that, I do give guitar lessons. <laughs> um, so, but, well, thank you very much. That was very nice of you to say that. So, um, but it is, it's right. It's, it's all about quality of life. It's not about the length of life. And what my friend says is, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But really, um, yeah, it's all about the quality of life. And PRT is unreal. It's so easy, okay? So, um, uh, well, it was for me. <laughs> and, um, it, but we need to get smarter at actually, you know, my data was affected by my diabetes. I thought it was a radiation sickness, but it wasn't. It was my diabetes that was acting up. So, uh, yeah, so I guess that's probably it. Thank you very much.